On the morning of September 2, 2025, engineers at Element Creations Limited began to arrive at their London headquarters, blissfully unaware that one of them was going to make the classic blunder of running the wrong thing on the wrong terminal. Although the name Element Creations makes it sound like they do something artsy like design Stardew Valley-esque games or make handmade jewelry, they actually work on something far cooler, the application layer communication protocol called Matrix. A protocol is just an agreed-upon set of rules for how something should be carried out. For example, a couple might decide on dinner using a simple four-step protocol, scan for new restaurant openings, fall back to the saved places backlog, escalate to ChatGPT, and if the five-minute timeout is breached, kill the process and default to Olive Garden. Likewise, as a communication protocol, Matrix must also define the step-by-step -step procedure for how data flows between client and server, answering questions like, What's the format of the messages? Or what's encryption look like? Or why do I even exist? That's right, Matrix must offer a very compelling use case as the real-time chat competition is pretty stiff. Why not just use WhatsApp or Slack or Ding Talk? Well, those are centralized platforms, meaning a big company like Metabook or Slack owns your chat history and will make you pay for it. Furthermore, since everything goes through a centralized server, if there is an outage, you will have no choice but to sign off from work early and go to Costco. In comparison, a platform like email is decentralized. You can create an account on dozens of email providers or even host your own email server. But email is very different from real-time chat. There's no rooms, typing indicators, reactions, read receipts. So they invented Matrix, the real-time chatting equivalent. Anyone, for example Element themselves, Mozilla, or the German military can spin up their own Matrix home server and begin messaging away. But just like how Gmail dominates the email market, the majority of Matrix user traffic is also centralized in large public home servers, the biggest of which is also the oldest, called the Matrix.org home server. This was the original reference server set up by the creators as an easy entry point for using Matrix. But as the community grew, it basically became the default server that everybody joined. Going back to Element Creations, their engineers were responsible for running the Matrix.org home server. They rented servers from a silly company named Mythic Beasts and ran Synapse on it, which is the premier Matrix home server software made by Element themselves. Synapse saves almost everything such as room state, events, messages, and accounts in Postgres, a database management system known for being pretty good. The primary Postgres database will further replicate to a secondary database used for failovers in case something goes wrong with the primary. When a Postgres database receives a write, it doesn't modify the data files first, but rather writes the transaction ahead of time to a write-ahead log and then modifies the data files. There are a ton of benefits for doing this, but none of them really matter right now. What does matter is that walls contain all the historical changes made to the database, meaning the secondary can pull the walls from the primary to replicate its changes. The walls were also archived onto Amazon's simple storage service for backup and restore purposes. This kind of database setup is quite common. In fact, GitLab, which we covered a while ago, used the same setup in 2017. Except in today's case, the primary database is called DB2, and the secondary database is called DB1. Anyway, Element saw that the database servers had reached 90% capacity at 51 terabytes of disk usage, so it was about time for an upgrade. At 11.03 AM, Mythic Beasts added two extra NVMe drives to DB2, the primary, and DB1, the secondary. 14 minutes later, an existing drive mysteriously disappeared from the RAID array of DB2, the primary. This was not too unusual, as adding a new device can trigger a rescan of all devices, so existing drives may drop offline if there are any connection issues. But because DB2 used redundant array of independent disks level 10, or RAID 10, or RAID 1 plus 0, or mirroring plus striping, it was still technically functioning normally. This is because the one part of the 10 means mirroring, so an exact copy of the data was stored on two disks, meaning one disk failing could always be tolerated. But now that this tolerance has been used, it was no longer safe to keep DB2 in service. This situation is why Element had DB1, the secondary database. At 12.57, the engineers began shifting customer traffic to DB1 before taking DB2 down for maintenance. A cool 30 minutes later, the traffic shift was complete. Yay, now DB1 was actually the primary. But there was a catch. 
Due to some bug in the archiving script, DB1 was not saving any backups to S3. The current state meant if DB1 experienced some kind of hardware failure, customer data would be permanently lost, as there was neither replication to DB2 nor backups being saved. This probably sounded kind of hashtag scary to the engineers, so they decided to start replicating traffic to DB2, effectively turning the former primary database into a secondary. Around 20 minutes later, DB2 had fully caught up with DB1, and they decided to do a quick restart of DB2 in hopes of restoring the RAID array. So a reboot should cause a rescan and bring everything back to normal. In theory, at least. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and DB2 was done rebooting. Not only did the drive not come back online, but a second drive also went missing, causing the RAID array to fail to assemble. So the server ended up booting into recovery mode, meaning it was basically completely inoperational. They were back to square one, except DB2 was even more broken now. But the chaos had just begun. About an hour and a half later, they reached the conclusion that the RAID array on DB2 and all of its contents were gone for good. So in the following hours, they prepared a fresh new DB2 instance to restore from backup. They also fixed the bug that prevented DB1 from saving walls to S3 to ensure the backups were up to date. Having installed the latest version of Postgres, the restoration process began at 5.25 p.m. So while it's technically possible to restore a database using only write-ahead logs, that would be a rather strange thing to do, since for long-standing enterprises that would involve saving petabytes of walls that take literally weeks to replay. Instead, snapshots of the database are taken, which in Postgres's case are called base backups. Element also used a third-party backup tool called WallG, which also supported incremental backups, containing only changes since the previous backup. So SSH'd onto DB2, they ran backup lists to find the most recent backup, which is a chain including both the base backup and incremental backups. Then, they ran backup fetch to extract that backup to a target directory. Just to make things convenient, they targeted the standard Postgres data directory. The output of the command was also written to a log file for debugging purposes. However, the backup fetch command failed. This was because the engineer at some point changed their shell directory to the data directory. When you write output to a file like this, the output file obviously needs to be created before the command executes. So restore.log was created in the data directory since that's where the command was run from. Then backup fetch ran, which based on the code will verify that its target directory is empty. Since the directory had this random log file in it, the command failed. No problem, the engineers could simply switch to the home directory and run the command from there. This way, restore.log will be created in the home directory instead, and everything would be good. They ran the command again, and it failed again. Haha, <laughs> rookie mistake. They didn't delete the restore.log file created in the data directory from the first run, so the target directory still wasn't empty. No problem, I got this. Someone said from the other side of the room, I'll go ahead and delete the contents of the data directory. Should be fine, of course, since the server is offline anyways. The engineer focused his entire being into his laptop screen and performed a few mental calculations. Okay, remember, it was the primary that had the hardware fault, and now we're trying to restore it, so delete the data directory of the primary. Looks like I have DB1 open, that's probably the primary, right? Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Everyone knows that the primary is supposed to be DB1, but our primary has always been named DB2, so I should run the command on DB2. But wait, we swapped the primary and secondary, didn't we? So that means the secondary is DB2 and the primary is DB1 now. So DB1 it is. Ah, whatever. This is too confusing. I'm just gonna run it on the shell session I have in front and see what happens. He typed in the command to recursively force remove all the files in the data directory and ran it. And noticed it was taking a surprisingly long amount of time. This was kind of weird, so he cancelled the command just in case but it was too late. He had run the command on DB1, the new in-service primary, not DB2, the original primary they were trying to restore. The entire service has to be shut down, officially taking the matrix.org home server offline. It was 6 p.m. when this happened, and the engineers quickly remounted the data partition of DB1 as read-only to prevent further damage, in case it could be salvaged by data recovery tools. After taking the time to consider their options, they concluded that they should just continue what they were doing before, which was to restore from their S3 backups. So this time, they correctly set up the empty Postgres data directory on DB2, and once again ran backup fetch to restore to the latest daily backup. 
Transferring 51 terabytes of data was going to take a while, so it was time to kick back and enjoy the fact that if Matrix was functioning as intended, being a decentralized protocol, the server outage shouldn't really impact anyone. Rise and shine, and it was now 7.21 the next morning. Data extraction from the weekly base backup was complete. However, as soon as WAG started to restore the daily incremental backups, it immediately failed. This was due to a known bug in WAG that had already received a fix. Element had previously encountered this bug on their regular backup recovery tests, but they only updated WAG to fix the bug on their test servers, not the actual production servers. Updating WAG now and rerunning backup fetch would mean downloading the entire 51 terabytes again, so the engineers decided to patch WAG to accept a non-empty data directory with the base backup and to skip straight to the incremental backups. About two hours later, all the incremental backups were fully restored and they were ready to replay the walls. The playback rate was slower than expected. There were 18 hours of transactions in the walls and replaying these took another five and a half hours. By four in the afternoon, they finally had a working database instance with no data loss. Now it was just a matter of starting Synapse back up and bringing the home server back online. By 6 p.m., 24 hours after the outage and 31 hours after the initial hardware failure, Matrix.org was back. But their work wasn't done yet. Only DB2 was in service. DB1 was still sitting there half deleted. But the European engineers were tired. So it was time to go to bed while their one American SRE kept tabs on everything to make sure their single database setup didn't go haywire. Back to work at 9am London time, they encountered a few minor hiccups in restoring DB1, but soon enough they copied over the data from DB2 and set it to replicating. So what can we learn? During the outage, problems arose when the engineers had to go off script from their runbooks due to their commands failing. There are various ways to make the commands more bulletproof, such as outputting restore.log to an absolute path rather than its current relative path. But scripts failing due to outdated libraries, transient network issues, or operator error is basically inevitable. So accidentally deleting the wrong thing in this situation really has no clear solution. Renaming the databases to make sense would help, but that didn't do much for GitLab. Changing the background color of the terminal could also help, but in high pressure situations, sometimes you don't see color. You could recommend moving instead of removing, but that requires engineers to follow recommendations. So you could ban RM from ever being run, but then the opposite case will happen where not being able to manually remove a file takes everything down. Therefore, the ace in the hole is simply to restore from backup faster. No matter if your database is accidentally deleted by a human, AI agent, or cat walking across the keyboard, faster backup restores are universally beneficial. In order to achieve this, Element increased the frequency of incremental backups, as restoring from them is much faster than replaying walls. But unfortunately, since backups need to be downloaded over the network, I suppose there's nothing that can be done about slow transfer speeds. Or is there? What if on top of backing up data to the cloud, we also back up locally on the database instance itself? At first glance, this seems crazy. Does taking a backup mean copying my entire database to another folder? That's literally going to take forever and explode my disk usage. Well, file systems like ZFS use special tactics to take snapshots of the entire disk quite effectively. So suppose our really small disk here has 10 blocks of data. A snapshot doesn't copy the actual data, that would be far too slow, but instead contains metadata describing which blocks make up the file system at the snapshot time. When a write later arrives for block 7, the storage system allocates a new block and writes to there instead of overwriting the old one. Now, the live file system points to the new block, but the snapshot continues to reference the original one. This way, if you accidentally delete your database, you can revert just by updating the live file system to point to the block tree of a prior snapshot, and you're done. No downloading and no copying. Just make sure you still have additional external backups in case the entire server fails. That's something King's College London had to learn the hard way.